Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kemler, and our next guests are three of the stars of the upcoming movie, Just Mercy. It's, uh, we have Tim Blake Nelson, Rob Morgan, and Karen Kendrick uh, joining us. The film uh, tells the true story of Walter McMillian, who was wrongfully convicted of murder and spent six years on death row until his case was appealed with the help of Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative. It's a beautiful, heartbreaking film. Uh, let's take a look at the trailer. Everybody, please welcome from Just Mercy, Rob Morgan, Tim Blake Nelson, and Karan Kendrick. Let's hear it. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations uh, on this film, a, a really beautiful film. And I will say, what I love about having you here and what I love about this film is that the film is anchored, yes, by, by, by Jamie and Michael in the center of the film, but more than that, there are no small characters in the movie. There, all no, there are no small parts. And your parts are filled out with so much personality and love. And they essentially, at the end, kind of make the movie for, for me because your performances are so beautifully written and, and, and nuanced. Can you talk about working with, with Destin uh, on, on your parts? Because oftentimes these parts would not, be, would not be given this much love, I think, both in performance and in detail. Who wants to answer that? <laughs> All right. Well, Destin wrote to me before we started filming, and I think this was probably the first time I've received an email of this kind. And he spoke to creating something that was different than what we're accustomed to. It's my first time working with Destin as well. And I was really inspired by the email, but once I got on set, I think I got it. Can I ask you what the email part, like summarize a little bit of what it said? Yeah, you can ask me. That was about a year ago, so I can tell you how it made me feel. Yeah. I can't repeat exactly what of it said. Of course. Said. But what, it, what I got from it was we are going to enter a space where we have a great opportunity, and we have to really be aware of the opportunity and honor it by sharing in, a, in the most human way possible. Um, and I think that's how Destin works. He, not just in this piece, but in his, in short term 12 as well, he allows people to be fully fleshed out and fully human. And in, the, in terms of Minnie McMillan, was really excited about that because quite often we see women, black women, as strong, as a kind of stand by your man. And that's it, that's where it begins and ends. But she's more than strong, she's terrified. She's hurt and she's healing at the same time. She is standing in the gap for her husband. She's leading a community and also being embraced by them. So it was more than just this one note and this one message or this one side of her. I think we really worked to show a whole person. And I think I saw that in everyone's work. We got to see, and I'll let the guys talk about you know, their roles, but we got to see people more than, beyond just an idea of who they are, beyond just a stereotype. And I think it speaks to Brian's work. You know, Brian has this incredible way of introducing us to ourselves, the good and the bad, the highs and the lows, and then allowing us to see who we are and be fully who we are, and then embrace that, and then go from there. So for me, Minnie's journey was about that, about presenting a whole woman and allowing people to get close enough to an experience that may not be their own and see what they can learn from it. And it, it's kind of like you said, it, it's much easier said than done to do that with a movie. That's why we always get these kind of not fully fleshed out, one-dimensional stereotypes of char characters that surround your leads because I think oftentimes writer-directors don't know how to flesh them out. They're scared of taking up too much time or mm -hmm. devoting too much time to that. And it takes a real smart person to, I think, know how to do that inside of a story. Um, Rob, I would say that your character as well, who we meet uh, very early on in the film and is quite optimistic in a way about, about what Michael's character could bring to the table uh, as opposed to Jamie Foxx, who's much more pessimistic uh, at the beginning, uh, has a very clear, very tragic arc within the story. Um, what kind of research did you do? I, had imagined, I would imagine you felt an incredible amount of responsibility in terms of some of those things that you had to do. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I relished the opportunity to play Herbert Richardson because I did see the... Uh, sensitive responsibility of being the character 
that actually is guilty of a crime, but to present him in a way that the audience can possibly understand the mindset of a young man, 15 years old, drafted into the war before he has his first girlfriend, uh, serves to protect this country, see his platoon blown up, he's the only one that survives, to come back to America with very little to no uh, mental or emotional support to include him back into society. So then he meets a young lady that shows him some affection. Uh, her family out of nowhere moves to Alabama. So in his mind, he must follow the love of his life. And in his mind, in order to communicate to the love of his life, he must use the language that he's been conditioned with, which is war. So in his mind, he builds a bomb places it by her house, expecting that when the bomb detonates, he will swoop in, save her, and she will be the love of his life forever. But unfortunately, two young ladies picked up the, the package and one of them lost their lives. So now we have this character in our judicial, in our justice system being punished with those kind of circumstances. And I felt the uh, beautiful opportunity to present that kind of character so the audience can ask themselves, is he worthy of that kind of punishment? So for my preparation, I used the book Just Mercy that Brian Stevenson wrote, very eloquent. It's full of many other characters also that are experiencing this. It uh, flushes out Herbert Richardson's story in more detail. And there was two pictures of Herbert Richardson that I could just stare into. I would just stare at the picture, stare into his eyes, and try to download his spirit and mindset. And then... Uh, what did you take from, from those eyes and, and that spirit? Well, man, I mean, it's one picture of him sitting right by the, uh, the death chair that he's going to get killed in, you know? Uh, that right there to understand how that must feel as a human being, knowing that we all have the same wants, needs, and desires but for you to be sitting there and then somebody's taking a picture of you by a chair that you're gonna lose your, take your last breath in. As an artist, uh, actor, storyteller, trained in my instrument, go deep into that imagination. Go deep into your own personality and, and, and flavor of what would move you around that. You know what I mean? And then compound what you know of the character and, and find the truth in that. And, and get comfortable in that truth. And once I discovered what I felt was Herbert Richardson's spirit and mindset, I uh, contacted my very first acting coach, who's Keith Johnston, and uh, I showed him some of the things that I, I had prepared, and he gave me the thumbs up. And from there, I was just ready to come to set and play, have a good time. Um, how did you do, what were you thinking about when you did the execution Scene. I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that. This yeah. is based on a true story. You can <laughs> yeah. read the book or, or look <clears throat> it up. But mm -hmm. um, that is an incredible responsibility to do that justice, to figure it out. How much of that responsibility do you put on your shoulders or put on Destin's uh, shoulders? Man, I, I felt that uh, we rarely see a scene like that in cinema. And I, I uh, again, relish the opportunity to give voice to this voiceless character that a lot of people would never have gotten contact with unless they do see this movie or read this book. And um, like Tim talks about in some of our other interviews, I took my time. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I was breathing. I was feeling. I was listening. I was, I was all my senses were intact. Uh, very first time I was to ever see the chair, I made an agreement with Destin I didn't want to see the chair until we said action. So that would also inform me. I have never seen this chair before until my very first take. So me going down this hallway, imagining what this chair must look like, feel like, all kinds of things for the very first time. And then when I turn that corner and see it, it, it just it just hit me. It hit me in so many ways. So Can I, I ask, is that is that the take that's in the movie? Yeah, I'm sure oh, okay, it is. Good, good. I, I, I lost everything. I, feet, legs, everything went from under me, and uh, yeah. Um, but I appreciate Destin for giving me that opportunity to help inform my character, you know, for that rich, uh, fresh experience, and then to be prepared to let it flow through me naturally. Uh, Tim, last time you were here, you had brought up Just Mercy briefly, and you said that this was 
one of the few working experiences that you had that changed your life. It changed your outlook on life. It changed your, your politics in a way that you were just sort of unaware of exactly what the situation was with the, with the death penalty in some states. It certainly did. And, and a lot of that has to do with the two extraordinary people to my right and the performances they, they brought to this movie. Uh, I, I think in each of their cases, there's such a selfless restraint in their performances. You never find either of them uh, being showy or uh, pointing up their own performances. Uh, you find just absolute simple truth. And in each case, it's, it's utterly heartbreaking. Uh, and then that, that's also true with, uh, with Jamie and Bree and Michael B. Jordan. Um, what we're exploring in this movie is a broken criminal justice system in which, uh, to quote Brian Stevenson, you're better off in our country being rich and guilty than you are being poor and innocent. And that incoherence, that oxymoron, just is not something we can any longer accept. And by delving into this story and exposing it to a largely unaware America, and particularly my community of, of white people uh, uh, who don't even know the statistics, as an example that one in three people of color, one in three African Americans is expected to spend, African American males, is expected to spend time in jail uh, who were born in this century. Uh, that for every nine executions, one has proven to have been an execution of an innocent. We can't allow this to go on. And this movie, without ever dipping into agitprop or sentimentality or mawkishness or preachiness, uh, exposes a very ugly truth about our country, which is this awful cocktail of our racism. Our obsession with the punitive. Our obsession with the punitive as manifested in the hypocrisy of the death penalty, mm -hmm. where we say, as, uh, as a nation, or state by state, uh, if you kill, we might kill you. That's just simply hypocritical. And, and executions, make no mistake, are premeditated murder, which the judicial system says is the worst kind. But an execution is scheduled, it's done as efficiently as possible. In fact, we keep revising the ways in which it's done to make it more efficient. Now, instead of a cocktail of three drugs, there's a, a, a new uh, single drug injection uh, that, um, that will make executing people even more efficient. That's the state guilty of premeditated murder. And we're all a part of that hypocrisy as long as we call ourselves Americans. There's an incredible line um, in the first act of the film that one of the prisoners who in the in the sort of montage of prisoners that are on death row that are speaking to Brian for for the for the first time mm. one of them says the judge said to me 70 reform was a myth propagated 70 years ago I think I'm, I'm probably getting the line wrong but something along those lines and this idea that there is no such thing as prison as reform within our prisons at this at this point they're not there for that reason uh, Rob was talking earlier and about the 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 lie of rehabilitation yeah. and his experience of that in the jail cell scene Maybe it was rehabilitation was a myth from 70 years ago. Some, one of those two things yeah Rob yeah, I mean, if it was really about uh, rehabilitation, then I think the system would be uh, operating on a whole different accord, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, Tukey Williams, anybody familiar with Tukey Williams? He was the guy credited for starting the Crip game in L.A. Well, while he was serving time in prison, he actually uh, became a, a top seller uh, children's book writer, uh, 
denouncing gangs. He was also uh, nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, right? Uh, they executed this man. Is that rehabilitation? You see what I'm saying? Like, even while he was in, he still was able to show that rehabilitation was possible, but then they still executed this man under Arnold Schwarzenegger. But that's something totally different. That's just uh, another case of injustice, I believe, or another case of how if the system was re really about rehabilitating, I don't know if it would be as, as, uh, as, as sick as it is to house somebody in a four by eight cell is that really healthy? Is that really giving somebody an opportunity to say, okay, I'm, I've, I've committed wrong and I'm ready to change? You see what I'm saying? Like, is that really rehabilitation? Or give the system or state's attorneys absolutely no initiative to uh, pull cases back or, 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 or go through the appeals process, right? Like, all of the state's attorneys uh, or prosecutors, for the most part, once someone is convicted, they have no interest in, yeah. trying, to, in trying to help with the appeals process whatsoever. That, or even if you can afford Yep. representation to even get an appeal, which oftentimes people are put in places where, uh, like Khalif Browder, the young man, 15 years old, that was convicted of uh, taking a, a, a book bag, which was found to be a, a, a lie, and this young man spent three years in a grown man prison at Rikers Island without even seeing a court date. And that's justice. But then you can have a 14-year-old kid run a red light and kill a family of four, and he's uh, given the penalty of affluenza because he was too rich to understand what he was doing. Is that justice? I think something that Brian talks about is there's a quote that he says, you know, we don't put crimes in jail, we put people in jail. And I think that what is happening when we think in terms of the legal system in America, the system, when we think in terms of reform, and they're kind of all these big words, these umbrella words, these umbrella ideas, but we have to get back to the core, which is understanding humanity and understanding that we are all human. When you think in terms of another idea that Brian has uh, in terms of you know, the fact that slavery didn't end, it just evolved. Mm -hmm. And so then the worth of a person is then determined by that underlying theme. And so if we can begin to have conversations, if we can begin to enact change that really restores humanity and dignity at its core to every person, then you can't dismiss or disregard a person. Mm -hmm. As long as you can label someone other, as long as you can discount someone's being, you can do anything with them. But if you can honor the person as a human being and see their worth, it's very difficult to make those sweeping charges or sweeping, sweeping um, discriminatory acts against someone whose life you value and you recognize. And so I think that the work that Brian is doing and I think that the conversations that this film in particular is fostering helps us get to a place as a nation where we begin to recognize the humanity in every person. And I believe that is at the core of the change that we so desperately need. Absolutely. And I love the conversations because Tim also brings up a great conversation around your character, Ralph Myers, about how the system uses that particular group to propone uh, uh, to keep propelling the idea of racism. Could you please expound on that, Tim? Oh, just uh, uh, how the system co-ops poor whites against poor blacks to sustain its power and how a poor white who should feel a kinship with a poor black person in a capitalist society is actually then instead turned against blacks by, very cynically, by a power structure that wants to hang on to uh, supremacy, uh, racial supremacy. And I don't, you know, I don't beat these drums. I'm not, um, uh, maybe perhaps I should. I don't honestly believe actors uh, uh, should be out at the forefront um, uh, stumping uh, for partisan issues. Uh, but there are just truths that this film exposed uh, and exposes. Um, and yeah, one of them is how poor whites are co-opted by the system 
uh, to keep black people down. And my character in the movie, if you see it, uh, is an example of how that occurs. Um, we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who's the question? Hi, uh, you touched on this uh, pretty much just now, but I'm wondering what the main message that you hope people take from this film is, and also what they can do you know, in everyday life to help with these issues that are very, very prevalent in our justice system today. I'll give the, the quick, boring answer, but it's, it can really have a huge impact. Brian Stevenson runs an organization called the Equal Justice Initiative. You can go to it online, EJI, uh, and there are all sorts of programs that um, will not only educate you the way we were all educated by Brian Stevenson, um, but also uh, provide um, uh, ways in which you can act. Yeah. I think that's it. Um, Brian has been doing this work for over 30 years. And, you know, I often say it's when you when you look at the work that still has to be done, it can feel kind of over, overwhelming. The question that I had to ask and answer for myself is, what is your something? No one can do everything, but everybody can do something. And so what is your something? What can you do from where you stand with what you have and with who you have access to? How can you be consistent? And And, you know, we often, again, think big. We think, okay, well, I'm going to go to law school, and I'm going, and that's great if you do, but what do you have in your hands, and how can you offer that for change? I'd piggyback that, and also I'd like to add that uh, just because you see something wrong with the American system and you want to say something, that doesn't make you anti-American. That just makes you even more American because you want to do something right. You see what I'm saying? So I hope. The, the, the conversation starts with that also because I feel like a lot of people are reserved with what they really can do because they don't want to come off as being anti-American if they just point out something that's really wrong in truth. So, yes, you can actually say, no, that's, that's not justice. So Absolutely. One more. Hi, we have an online question from our site. Um, someone wants to know um, what were you guys able to do to get through some of the harder scenes to film? Um, how'd you kind of get through those and give us? Go ahead. <laughs> um, we have we had an incredible ensemble of storytellers, and I think um, Jamie Foxx provided a lot of levity in the scenes that that I was in, and and not always in the way that you may think. Yes, he's a comedian, and so there were funny stories, but there were also very um, powerful stories that he poured into us about his experiences. He had a speaker. And sometimes he would play music that would maybe help to uh, define or usher us into or out of a moment that we were in. So I think it was everyone kind of honoring the space and then oftentimes Jamie taking the lead in, in the scenes that I was in with him where he kind of helped to maneuver around those, those rough spots. I've heard about this speaker. I think it's becoming sort of notorious in a way or like at least simpatico with, with Jamie. It's just with him all the time. Yeah. Um, does anyone else want to take that question? Well, well, for me, man, uh, you know, I approach what we do as play. Uh, I'm thankful to understand that I'm actually taking a slice of this person's life and able to commit to it for a temporary amount of time. Um, understanding that this person actually had to live and go through this and couldn't say, cut, all right, hair and makeup, Take off the you know take off the wardrobe, wash your head, go back home. You know the person didn't have that opportunity, so uh, I always be grateful to think that I am in the business of of giving voice to the voiceless, and I'm very grateful for that. And that gratefulness comes from understanding that there's somebody out there right now picking up elephant dung to feed a family, and I don't have to do that by the grace of God. So that helps me even more to understand, hey, this is a blessing to do what I do, and it's fun. And I don't let it beat me up so much. You know what I mean? I commit to it when I'm there, and then once I'm gone, I'm back to being Rob Morgan, because I love being Rob Morgan. <laughs> and we love you being Rob Morgan. <laughs> we love it. And we love your performance as, as, uh, as, uh, Ralph, as, as Ralph Richardson. Um, uh, I, I, um, it's not Ralph Richardson. Herb. It's Herb. Ra Herbert Richardson, Ralph Myers. He mixed us both up. Yeah. We're so uh, in love. We've been uh, <laughs> so, yeah. It's a good question. I think that I, I don't think I'm unique in this. That that um, uh, that it's so exhilarating 
to get to work on a film like this, and it's such a privilege uh, as an actor to be able to explore even uh, tragic humanity. We're incredibly lucky uh, to get to, um, to put it a certain way, uh, rehearse life, mm. which is what it is to perform. You're, it's a rehearsal for life. And I think that's what it is to see a movie as well, or to see a play. Uh, and, you know, we actually have mirror neurons in our brains. I mean, it's actually chemical um, through which we empathize with what's going on on stage or on a screen. And as actors, we get to do that in a really deep and therefore exhilarating way. And so, yes, uh, you can have a part um, in which, in a certain sense, you have to smell hell. Uh, but you, as Rob says, you get to come out of that. And no matter, no matter how far down you might have gone, uh, you stand up from that a little taller. Mm. Yeah, it's actually a blessing it's, what you get yeah. to take with you. It's, it's always phrased in terms of like, how do you not take it with you? And sure, there's that part that you don't want to be like yelling at your family or something when you go home because you're still in that character. But when the shoot's over, you get to take a lot with you about what you've learned and any sort of wisdom that comes with telling that story, I would imagine. That's exactly right. Yes, you hit it on the head. <laughs> um, guys, it's a beautiful film. Congratulations. Incredible work. It opens in select theaters on December 25th, and then it is in theaters everywhere on uh, January 10th. Thank you so much for being here it was and talking to me. Thank uh, you. Just Mercy. Everybody give them a huge round of applause. Thank you. 